Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Jesus. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He has sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, you gave your one and only Son to be the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and believed to the ends of the earth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We turn our attention to the readings from God's Word, from the Scriptures. Our first lesson will serve as the sermon text this morning. Uh, what I want you to listen for in this, in this first listen is just how much God is able to give us through Christ. Not necessarily physically, although that's not excluded either, but, but that fullness of the knowledge of His love that permeates every area of our life leading to this full experience with God. Life with, with God is truly a full life. A lesson from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long 
and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, I invite children to come forward for a children's message. Good morning. Maybe I'll just stand back. It's hard to hear in there. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming up here. Jesus wants to share his love with you. Today, in just a minute, the next reading I'm going to read, we're going to hear Jesus do an amazing thing. And I'm going to kind of show you what it is. I'm going to, I'm going to perform a, a pretty cool magic trick, okay? What do you think is in this, in this jar? It's water, right? Yep. And, and some of you, you saw me get it out of the out of the sink in the kitchen, right? So it is. It's just, just regular water. But I don't want just regular water. How about some wine this morning? Do you think I can turn this water into wine? No. You, you don't? Well, watch this. I'm going to pour it in this glass, and I've got a, a magic stirring stick in there. Oh, it's already starting. And if I use my magic stirring stick, look it. It's changing, isn't it? Is it wine? Looks like, yeah, it looks like wine, right? Is it? <laughs> it looks like it, right? But maybe, yeah, you're right to doubt me because I, I can't perform any magic tricks. You know what this was? It was food coloring. So I had food coloring at the end of the stick and I made it turn red. So if you drank it, it probably wouldn't be very good, but it's still just water, right? I'm not a very good magic worker, am I? Yeah, that's okay. You're, you're exactly right. I might not be able to do this, but we're going to hear a story about Jesus one time coming to a friend's party. They were having a party because there was a big wedding. And they were all celebrating, and they were, they were adults drinking wine, and, and guess what? They ran out of wine. All they had was water. And... Um, it's different from today. They didn't have sinks. Water just kind of sat around in it, so it wasn't really good for you. So people didn't really drink water then. They had to drink wine so they wouldn't get sick, okay? So what did Jesus do? Jesus turned water into wine. And it wasn't with food covering. It wasn't with a magic stick. Why was Jesus actually able to change water into wine? What do we know about Jesus that allowed him to do that? Who is he? <laughs> Jesus is God, right? Jesus has the power of God. He's the one who created everything, and so he even has power over water, and he's able to change that into wine. Now, why would Jesus change water into wine? Was he showing off? Did he just want to be cool? No. Whenever Jesus uses his power, it's for a, a reason of love. It's because he loved people. First of all, he didn't want the people who were throwing this party to, have, to be embarrassed and to have shame, and so he showed his love for them. Uh, Jesus also showed his love by turning water into wine so that he knows that he wants to make people happy. When you believe in Jesus, when you have a life with Jesus, it's a happy life. He wants to give us joy. But there's one more important reason. If you saw somebody who was able to actually change water into something else, wouldn't you want that guy as your friend? Couldn't he do a lot of things for you? Yeah. And that's the whole point. He wanted to show you that if he's able to change water into wine, he's also able to take your sins and get rid of them. He's able to change our hard hearts into soft hearts. He's able to change our cold hearts into warm hearts. And it's all through the cross. The greater miracle than changing water into wine is him taking our sins, covering them with his blood, and we come out clean, as white as snow. So when you hear about Jesus doing a miracle, 
That's why we put our faith in him. He is our great God. He is our loving God. And he's able to do all things, including forgive our sins and take us to heaven. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up here and watching my magic trick and hearing about Jesus' love. You can go back to your seats. The gospel records the words and the works of our Savior, and so I invite you to stand in respect. This is the account that we just talked about with, with the children's message, and, and we, we see that as a result of Jesus showing his power, uh, people put their faith in him, and may we do the same thing. The gospel according to John chapter 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water joy jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then Jesus told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We'll sing our next song. Uh, the next song reminds us that there are all kinds of things that offer fulfillment in this world, and many of them are good blessings from God, but uh, when it comes right down to it, give me Jesus instead because he brings more fulfillment.
Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our meditation today is the first lesson from Ephesians chapter 3. We'll be looking at that lesson in its entirety throughout the sermon today. You know, I just, I don't take very many pictures of the mountains anymore. I don't know about, about you if that's been your experience the longer you live here, but I, I don't. You, you look at my camera roll from a year ago on my phone and it's just flooded with mountain pictures. Now not so much. And, and here's why. Here, here's the last mountain picture I took. This was actually a hike we took on New Year's Day. Absolutely beautiful. One of the, the best hikes, I, hikes I've taken so far. And I took this picture and I think it's a pretty nice picture. I think it's a, a beautiful picture. I, I posted it online so my family and friends, so I could brag to my family and friends, and, and they say, oh, it's nice, it's beautiful, wow. But I think that's why I don't take pictures of it anymore, because they say, wow, and it's nice, and then they scroll on. Even I look at it, and I'm disappointed, because that's not what I experienced. Right? When you're in the mountains, it's different from a picture. Right? It's not just, and that's not just nice and, and beautiful, it's this all-immersive, this all-encompassing experience that really is beyond description. You just have to be there, right? So that's why I don't take very many pictures of the mountains anymore. I bring that up because I wonder if at times our faith and our relationship with God is kind of like a picture of the mountains. In this way, I have no doubt in my mind that you look at your faith in Jesus and you know that it's a beautiful thing. I have no doubt in my mind that you look at the fact that you have a relationship with God Almighty and and you appreciate it so much. I mean, that's why you're here today. That's why you're joining online. That's why you, you pray. That's why you open your Bibles. I'm not questioning that a bit. But I wonder if it's Kind of one of those things where it's like, it's nice, it's beautiful, I appreciate it, but then you move on. There's other parts of your life that you have to take care of. There's other things that you enjoy, other places that you find fulfillment. And that's not necessarily wrong, but if if our life with God is just fine and nice and and beautiful and that's it, I'm, I'm not so sure that's what God intended for his relationship with you. When you think about the effort that God put in to establish it, when he left the glories of heaven, when he put himself under law, when he gave his own life on the cross, when he gives of himself to put his spirit in you, I don't think it was a take it or leave it kind of thing. It was meant to be this all immersive, all-encompassing experience with God, every aspect of your life. So that's what we want to explore as we take a look at these words from Ephesians chapter 3. We want to see that that life with God is more than you could ever imagine. It's more fulfilling than anything in the world. Keep that in mind as we take a look at Ephesians 3. So how do we know what our life with God is like? I wonder if our prayer life is a little bit of a window into that. What does our prayer life reveal about our, our life with God? I'll use this illustration. I remember uh, the first time that I sold a car on Facebook Marketplace. I was excited to do this, and I, I took the pictures, and I researched the Blue Book value. I posted it. Within like a couple hours, certainly before the end of the day, I had it sold. It was wild. I mean, a man showed up. He looked at it. He gave me the exact asking price. He didn't go back and forth, and he drove away. I should have been happy about that, right? I wasn't. I was upset. Why do you think I was upset? If I sold it that fast and that easy, what was my problem? I asked too little. (laughs) That was on my mind. I wasn't bold enough with my ask. I want you to think about that with your prayer life. What does our prayer life reveal about our God? Here's why I ask that. We're in Ephesians chapter 3 today. To get there, you go through chapters 1 and 2, and what you see is that God did some amazing things to establish a life with you. Before he even created the world, he thought about you 
and wanted you to be his child in Christ. And then in time, he sent his own son to redeem us from this world, from sin, from death, from the devil. And then he, he sealed us as his own children with, with his very own spirit. And what that did is it created this unity. <laughs> you have a unity with the God of the universe, the, the creator of the universe. And, and then that unity, then you get to chapter 2 of Ephesians, and you see that that unity exists now between us, between people. There's no difference in the way that God sees us. It doesn't matter who you are, what your past is, what, what others think of you, what your identity is. We're united in Christ. And then you get to chapter 3, and what this unity with God and with each other does is it gives us this bold, free access to God Almighty. Just fathom that. A bold, free access to God Almighty. And then that brings us to the, the question. Does our prayer life reflect this bold, free access to God Almighty, or is it more like my Facebook Marketplace ad and it's too little and too wimpy? Just take an examination of your prayer life. I, I did with mine. What do you pray about the most? I pray for health. I pray for safety. I pray for a good day on the job or at school. Um, Pray that this or that situation works itself out in a, in a God-pleasing way. Pray for some blessings to enjoy some satisfaction in this life. What are the bulk of your prayers? Now, hear me. Don't get me wrong. Those are fine prayers. Those are appropriate prayers. Keep praying those prayers. But what I'm wondering is this. With what we pray the most, does it reflect a bold, free access to God Almighty or is it kind of wimpy and fearful? The whole reason we want to ask that is because of, these, because of these verses before us in Ephesians chapter 3. Paul has a prayer. And when you look at this prayer, it is this bold, free access to God. This is a no-holds-barred, asking-for-the-moon kind of prayer. Let's take a look at it again. Paul says, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Why? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, you are all regular prayers, so I think you're qualified to evaluate his prayer. Is this a bold prayer? <laughs> I think it's beyond that, isn't it? It's, it's almost ridiculous what he's asking. And yet... When you look at that, what it does is reflect this bold, free access to the Almighty God. And, and the cool thing about all this is, he's praying this bold prayer for you, for Christians, for the Christians in Ephesus that he was pastor to, and the Christians of all time, for you. These are the things he's asking God for, for you. And so I want to take a look at the three big asks that he makes of God on your behalf and see how that applies to us. Let's look at the first one. He prays that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's a pretty bold ask, isn't it? Hey, Savior of the world, would you please make your home in each of these people's hearts? That's pretty bold. But on the flip side of it, you wonder what motivates him to ask that it's almost an embarrassing ask too, isn't it? It's embarrassing in this way. God promises that Jesus dwells in our hearts when we come to faith. And so he's talking about Christians, he's talking about the Ephesians, he's talking about you, and so he's really asking for something that we already have. Why would he do that? I think the fact that Paul asked this indicates maybe what kind of dwelling Jesus has in our hearts. And I think that's something that's important to consider. 
What kind of dwelling does Jesus have in your heart? How do you know what dwells in your heart? I think it's easy to see what is in people's hearts by what they talk about, right? Whatever's in our hearts, we're excited to talk about. How regularly do we talk about it? How, how freely, how, how passionately? We know what's in people's hearts. Have a conversation and you know what's in people's hearts over the last couple of years, going on three years. <laughs> COVID, right? Have you had a conversation with anybody that's lasted longer than a minute that doesn't involve COVID? It, that's on our hearts. So that's what I'm talking about. But what about people's passions? If somebody just started a new workout, do they talk about it? Absolutely. If somebody has this hobby that they have, they talk about it. Uh, their job, if they really love it, they talk about it. If it's a certain view on, on political things, or if it's finances, or if it's a, a concern for our environment, or, or for uh, social justice, we talk about it. The things that we talk about freely and regularly and passionately, those are the things that dwell in our hearts. So here's the question. How freely, how regularly, how passionately do you talk about Christ outside of these walls, in your homes, with your family, with your extended family, over coffee with a friend, at the copy machine at work, in the hallways at school? That'll show us what kind of dwelling Christ has in our hearts. And I think too often, it feels like Christ's dwelling is kind of like a tent with an overnight bag. It's not very permanent dwelling, is it? And so if that's true, it's no wonder why Paul prays this bold prayer for each one of us. Christ, dwell in their hearts. I know you already do, but what I want is I want them to be root. I want your home to be rooted Sending deep roots down so it's permanent. Firmly established, the, the picture of a firm foundation of a building. That's how he wants Christ to dwell in our hearts through his word. And, and when that happens, that's when we can experience the next thing that Paul prays for. Look at this ask. That you can grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. As I sat with this reading this week, this blew my mind to think about this. Think about that uh, mountain picture again. Why is a mountain picture just, eh, take it or leave it? It's because it's two-dimensional, right? It's just, it's flat. You don't have the experience. When you're out in, in nature, in the mountains, it's a three-dimensional experience. It's so much more. I, I, I like this quote from uh, John Muir, um, we are in the mountains and they are in us, kindling enthusiasm, making every nerve quiver, filling every pore and cell of us. It's an immersive experience, right? Three-dimensional. So now when it comes to Christ's love, that's the kind of experience Paul wants for you with Christ's love. Not just a nice, beautiful thing, but an immersive thing. And, and not only three-dimensional either, it's pretty cool that what Paul wants for you when it comes to Christ's love is what uh, physicists say is imperceptible to the human brain. What mathematicians say only exists in quantum theory. What Paul, how Paul wants you to experience Christ's love is in four dimensions. That's what I think of when I hear him say he wants you to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Just wrestle with that. He wants you to experience the impossible, the unfathomable. This is a beautiful thing. Paul imagines a world where even though the difficult questions we wrestle with and the tough teachings of Scripture that offend our human nature, even though they cause this cavernous gap between us and God, Paul imagines a, a place where there is nothing so wide that the love of Christ will not bridge it. Paul imagines a reality where there is not a length of distance that we can stray from God or even run from God, that the love of Christ cannot or will not travel to reach us. Paul imagines this reality where sin and guilt and shame and mistakes and regret 
dig a person to the deepest, darkest depths, and yet even there, it's not so deep that the love of Christ won't embrace you. Paul imagines a world where the highest heights of fulfillment and peace and love and belonging are, are, the, are the heights to which his love lift us. And when you talk about that, it seems impossible. It seems like only theory. How can we ever experience that kind of fulfillment? But it's not impossible. Because the height and the depth and the width and the, the length of God's love meet in the cross of Christ. And it flows from every direction of the cross of Christ. There's no direction you can move. There's no place you can occupy. There's no time, past, present, or future where the love of Christ cannot embrace you. Wow. And when you are immersed in Christ's love like that, so that you experience it in every moment, in every movement, in every situation that you're in, that's when you can start to experience the last thing, the climax of what Paul is asking for for you. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What does that even mean? <laughs> that you could experience the fullness of God just sit with that for a minute. This is kind of the way that I imagined it. Can you, um, if, if your good friend drove to church today in a Lamborghini, can you imagine asking her if she would just hand you the keys and give it to you? If your good friend just received a full ride scholarship, can you imagine asking him if he would just kind of gift that into your account? If your good friend just had a baby, can you imagine asking her to give you her child? <laughs> no way, right? I mean, it doesn't matter how good of a relationship you have with that person. You don't ask for their greatest joy and fulfillment in life. They're not going to give it to you. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. It's impossible. And yet that's what Paul asks for from God on your behalf. The fullness of God. Wow. It is ridiculously bold and it is beautifully real. You see, the more you experience that four-dimensional love of Christ from his cross in every area of your life, you can dare to imagine and you can dare to ask God to be in every situation of your life. In the gospel lesson, isn't that what Mary imagined? And Mary imagined a world where she could ask the Son of God to bring delight to a couple, to, to perform the impossible, to show his glory so that everybody could experience it. That's what she imagined. That's what she asked for. You can do that too. Imagine bringing that immersive love of Christ into the fear and the anger of the world of COVID. Wow. Imagine... Uh, taking the immersive love of Christ into your high school or, or college classroom. Imagine taking the immersive love of Christ into your home, into every aspect of your relationship with your spouse or with your children. Imagine taking the immersive love of Christ into the doctor's office, into your online activity, into every conversation with, your person, with a person, Imagine taking the immersive love of Christ into our church, into every meeting, every activity, every ministry. Wow. We would be so overwhelmed with a sense of love and belonging and forgiveness and fulfillment and satisfaction and eagerness and wisdom that there wouldn't be a problem that we would have to fear. There wouldn't be anything we wouldn't do to show God's love to each other. There wouldn't be a mission field that we could not reach. There wouldn't be any greater fulfillment in our life or in this world. That is what God intends for your life with him. 
And that sure is a different kind of church and faith experience than we usually think about, isn't it? And there's a reason for that. God never intended your life to, with him to be like those awful stereotypes, this dry, boring, sterile existence. That's not what he intends for you. No. Jesus came to do away with all the effects of sin in the world and in us. And why did he do that? So that he could bring you joy, so that he can give you delight beyond your wildest dreams. That's what this is all about. You can imagine more because of the bold, free access you have through Christ. That's what Paul imagined. So that's what Paul asked for for you. Would you dare to imagine that? Would you dare to ask for that for yourself, for each other? I sure hope so. And here's why. As big as that is, it's still too little for your God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. May that peace of God that goes beyond our understanding Guard to keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. This time we want to declare our Christian faith together. To do that, we're going to use the words of the Nicene Creed. They're printed on page 7 in the service folder. They'll also be on the screen. I invite you to stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And this time we'll continue by making use of that bold, free access to the Almighty God, and we're going to go to him in prayer. Uh, this morning I do have a special prayer of thanks. Uh, yesterday, in a private ceremony, uh, Levi Kenyon Nordwald was baptized into God's family. And so we give thanks and we ask God's blessing upon the family as they bring him up in the, in the Lord. Any other special prayer requests that you'd like to have today? Okay. What is his name? Michael Platnick. Michael Platnick. Okay, thank you. We'll have a prayer for, for him, for his family. Any other prayers? Okay, let's go to our God in prayer. Gracious God, we stand before you amazed not only at your power uh, and your almighty glory, but most of all at your love that your love that would um, bend down to, to come to this earth and, and save us and establish a relationship with you, our, our creator. We, we thank you for that, and we thank you for the bold access that we have to you as our Father in heaven through this. 
Lord, help us to always make use of that, that bold access that we have. And uh, taking our, our charge from, from Paul's prayer here, help us to, to go to you through Christ and ask for those wonderful blessings that you promise us. Dwell in our hearts richly and deeply, Lord Jesus. Give us power to, to be able to grasp more and more the impossible, the, the height, the width, the depth, uh, the length of your, of your great love. And, and fill, it, fill us with that so much that, that we are able to experience now that fullness that we have with you in our relationship. Help our life to reflect that, not this, this sterile existence with you, but a life of fullness in you. So much so that it, that it pours out from us and, and others may experience that as well. With our bold free access, Lord, we come to you in, in thanksgiving uh, on behalf of... Uh, the Nordwald family, as Levi was welcomed into your family uh, through baptism. We thank you for your promise to connect your promise with the water so that uh, through baptism we are joined to your death and your resurrection. Now that Levi is your dear child, be with him, uphold, uphold him in his faith, give his parents the, the strength and the wisdom to be able to raise him in your word so that he can continue to know the joy and fullness of life with you. Lord, we also ask you to be with the family and the friends of Michael Platnick who passed away unexpectedly this past week. Uh, we know that our times are in your hands and yet these things are, are difficult as we struggle with uh, what you never intended for us and that's death. Lord, during this time, be with the family, be with friends, help them to not only enjoy the, the great memory and time that they had with Michael, but also help them to turn to you and to know the comfort that only you can give as the resurrection and the life. Uh, help us to experience that, that comfort through Jesus our Savior. It's in his name that we pray all these things and in his name we continue. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts, Lord. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood, and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
may be seated. We now prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, to help you do that, there are uh, some questions that are, are helpful to guide your heart on pages 13 and 14 of the service folder. Uh, if you have any questions about Lord's Supper or the, the way that we practice Lord's Supper, uh, I'd be happy to, to answer those questions and to go through God's Word with you uh, after church or any time. So uh, all things are ready. We prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper.
You've just received the true body and blood of your Savior, Jesus. May it serve to strengthen you and preserve you in your faith to life everlasting. Go in peace, knowing that in Jesus, all our sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that today you have refreshed us with these saving gifts, your word and your sacrament. We pray that through them you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing song. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here today. I pray that God's word has lifted you up, has made you realize the, the fullness to which uh, God has brought you in him and to where he wants to bring you in the love of Christ. Um, a couple of announcements today. Uh, first of all, uh, it, we are having our uh, cup of peace latte bar. Some of you have been enjoying those throughout the service. That's awesome. Um, if you'd like to have a, a latte, a steamer, a uh, a tea, anything like that, uh, just go back to the, the kitchen area and put your order in and, and stay in some, enjoy some great coffee and also some great fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, connected with the Cup of Peace Latte Bar today, we're, it, it, the coffee is absolutely free, uh, but we are taking donations as well, and the donations are, are meant to uh, help 
with our fire relief. Um, that's going to go directly, every penny of it's going to go directly into our fire relief fund as we help families affected by the, the Marshall Fire and all the fires of that day. So uh, I think all the instructions about everything is, are in, in the kitchen. So, so check that out. Uh, today also, uh, after we visit a little bit, we're going to have a congregational meeting. It's our, our quarterly meeting and where we, we talk about... Uh, what ministry we've done, um, the ministry we have coming up planned. So you're welcome to stick around for that and, and put your input in or, or, or listen to the great, great ministry that God has given us here. So any other announcements that, that need to be made today? Okay, again, I just appreciate you being here. Appreciate you watching online. I treasure our, our peace family. I pray that God uh, builds us up together in unity and uh, in our faith. Have a great week in your Lord. See